Are you good? Awesome. Now that everybody is awake, <laughs> so I'm here to introduce you to a new concept. Um, let me just start by saying that um, my background is I've spent the last 15 years of my career in the trusted computing space. I've been one of the lead evangelists in this environment. And we're starting a new company to address the applications of these technologies into uh, the Bitcoin experience. And many people have heard lots of things about trusted computing. Some of them are true, some of them are not. Um, it's a little bit like the Bitcoin space. But let me just say there are two incredible global systems that are in place today. You have this global system of a blockchain or cryptocurrency that is really capable of amazing transactions. And certainly you've heard quite a few presentations around that today. Trusted Computing has just passed, um, it depends on which number you believe, the trustedcomputing.org site is at two billion and counting. I like to use about a billion because people have thrown away enough machines at this point. So there are about a billion computers that have a hardware security chip within the device whose sole purpose in life is to protect a private key. This technology is free, it's on your machine, you can choose to use it whenever and where, if, if you wish, you can turn it off if you wish. And it provides an incredible capability for tamper resistant hardware security for cryptography. And it's on a billion machines. So it's an interesting opportunity to use it and leverage it for the purposes of protection of keys. So what I'd like to do today is go through some of the ideas as to from very simple applications to more complex applications, how this technology can be married together with what's going on within the cyber currency space in both directions. One is, how can trusted computing provide a set of applications to help enhance the security of the existing Bitcoin community and other currencies? And in addition, how can the blockchain be used as a provisioning infrastructure for a billion device identity um, components and what would be the basis of that versus using the current scheme, which is a collection of certificate authorities. So I like to think of it as sort of three classifications or three core areas of capability. The first is something that's really simple, which I think everybody understands, which is I can bind my device to my wallet as an online service. In essence, it's just my device is another factor. It's no different than a wallet, for example, sending an SMS code to your phone each time and you have to go pick up your phone, answer the phone call, respond back, and you've, in essence, engaged in that transaction an additional component, which is prove you also, contain, you also have control of this phone. The second is how do I seal a private key with the keys that are in a trusted platform module. So a trusted platform module isn't capable of doing the elliptic curve functionality that exists in the current Bitcoin specifications or protocol. It actually uses older fashioned crypto like SHA-1 and now SHA-256 in the protection of the actual signing of keys. But it is possible to use the private key that contains within a trusted platform module to bind up and seal the use of the private key that you would then use for your Bitcoin wallet. And the third is by far probably the most interesting, which is that most modern devices today are coming with a set of capabilities to do trusted execution. What trusted execution is, is imagine an entire additional computer inside your computer, isolated from the primary operating system at the hardware level, that is capable of both protecting the private key and executing the instruction to the blockchain, actually doing the signature operations, this account to that account, sign it, this amount of, um, of coin. And so it's able to encompass inside the hardware of your device isolation. It's as though you took a Trezor wallet, instead of having it as an external device, imagine if you could just open up the case and glue it inside your computer. So it would be fine, you could glue it inside your computer and as long as it was only connected when it was actually required, that'd be great. And if you could miniaturize it sufficiently so it fit within your Android phone, even better. We don't want to carry two devices, that's not the benefit. We want to carry a single device, but we want the isolation characteristics of an independent hardware wallet. 
So maybe just a minute on who the trusted computing group is. So this is a standards body. There are over 130 companies. Almost all the major manufacturers in the world are members of the trusted computing group. It develops specifications. It doesn't write technology. It doesn't produce lines of code. It is a classic standards body. By the way, you're familiar with these. These are the same standards bodies that gave you USB, Ethernet, um, et cetera, TCP, it goes on and on. It is a body that's controlled by majority vote. Um, there is a board of directors. You can see the list of the board of directors. Um, my previous company was a board member since its founding. And the, it provides a very broad set of specifications. So this is a classic picture that the Trusted Computing Group's been using for years. This is all the areas that they actually write specifications on today. By the way, a few of these would touch the Bitcoin community. Whoops, it has an automation in it. Um, so one of those is um, the simple process of trusted computing within the device. Another is printers and copiers. Turns out that there's this whole problem in printing secure identities, and there's been a working group working on secure printing capabilities, which obviously if you had those kind of capabilities in every generic HP printer would be kind of fun if you were printing, for example, private keys, and you wanted to know that they were tamper resistant, hadn't been altered, couldn't be copied, and that there was proof that they came off the right printer. That'd be interesting. Oh, that's the national identity program for anybody who wants to print a national identity card. It's an identical problem. There's a bunch of crazy people in the identity space worrying about secure printers who've been writing stuff down in this area for years. Um, network security, mobile phones. It's a fairly broad, very active group. And for good or for bad in this community, it's been supervised by almost all of the major governments. So they're not members, they can't vote, they don't have a vote on any of the specifications, but if you go to the standards meetings, you will get to hang out with the CESG guys, the NSA guys, the Germans, the Chinese, the Japanese, they've all been coming to quite a few of the meetings for a long time. Why? Because they're really interested in the context of tamper-resistant hardware security in all the devices. So it's been a... It's been an interesting standards body. It's been very effective. It's shipped a ton of technology, and it continues to move forward and deliver new capabilities. TPM 2.0, which is the replacement of 1.2, has just begun shipping in the last year. It's required on everything with a Microsoft logo as of January 1st, 2015. So it will outship in volume the equivalent of all of iPhone's volume shipments, just to put it in scope we'll have two TPM 2.0 on the box. And the question is, well, so do we use it? By the way, TPM 2.0 is crypto agile. In theory, if you had a Bitcoin working group within TCG, you could, in theory, put the Bitcoin protocol inside the trusted computing device um, if you get the manufacturers to agree to it. I'm not sure that's the right path. It would take two to three years to get the chip guys to do that. You'll have a broader trusted execution environment before you'll get it um, in the chip. So what's a TPM? A TPM chip is a trusted platform module. It's a chip on your motherboard. It is secured and soldered to your motherboard. There are now actually virtual TPMs where they actually run the protocol of the chip but in a trusted execution environment. So for example, if you have, um, it's not this one, this is the Surface Pro, but if you have a Surface RT, it's an ARM-based processor. It has a TPM in it, but it's a TPM that runs in ARM trust zone. The ARM processor has a secure area in it, and it actually presents the capabilities of the trusted platform module chip. Um, there's a billion of them. Uh, it's on all your Windows mobile devices. So anybody who has a Windows mobile phone has a TPM in it. Um, it's across all the Microsoft infrastructure. Actually, there are TPM primitives in Xbox as well, which is a little bit interesting. Um, and so what's it do? It does a very simple thing. It has the ability to generate a key pair in the silicon publish the public key, which you can check the signatures on to know it came from the right chips, and hold the private key in a manner that it cannot be copied. It has lots of other capabilities and features as well, but fundamentally in this environment, that one thing is incredibly valuable. I can generate a private key that the user can delete, but they can never make a copy of. This is a software tamper-proof, hardware tamper-resistant device, which means no amount of malware will move that key. You want to spend a million dollars in the lab at your local college and begin to extract a key, 
There was a black hat demonstration that was done about three years ago where they successfully penetrated the metallization layer of the chip, a negative layer so you can not get probes through. They peeled back a window of that mesh, put a probe through, put it on the bus of the chip, and successfully got a bus signal off of a single chip. They destroyed a few hundred chips and they spent a million dollars in the process. I like to think of that as better than any third party certification. Some idiot actually spent six months of his life and a million dollars and blew up a bunch of chips to put a probe on. The part that's really fun is he did it to an Infineon part and the Infineon guys added capacitance. So now instead of just jumpering the mesh, which would be the classic break the window, you know, break in where you put the bubble gum wrapper in the window and you break the window. Now you have to put the bubble gum wrapper in and maintain impedance, which is actually a little bit more complicated. So this is the beauty of an industry standard. Commodity chips broadly available, everybody can have a go at them, find a vulnerability, publish it. Then because Infineon sells 100 million of these chips, they might spend more than a nickel or two actually resolving the problem and making sure that the next generation of technology doesn't have the problem. By the way, side channel analysis, if anybody hasn't gone to RSA and seen this company out in San Francisco that shows you extracting the private keys out of an iPhone from a foot about three feet away with an antenna because there's no power analysis prevention in the main processor chips is brilliantly good fun. You just don't believe it's possible. Actual crypto chips inside your iPhone extracted from a meter away. So. The, th the other piece of this is there's a whole other track that's going on. So if trusted computing is one environment, the second is this trust environment within ARM devices. Why are ARM devices important? This is the chip that powers everybody's smartphone. And so in ARM, what they've done is they've exposed a whole set of capabilities for trusted execution in the ARM processor. And today, on ARM devices, the trusted platform module specifications are implemented as an app that runs in trust zone. This is an interesting space to watch. I'm very hard to program for today because you have to get in a deal with the manufacturer before they ship the phone. There are efforts underway with what's called ARM Trustonic to provide an after the fact application distribution module so that you'll be able to write programs that run on any smartphone that has these capabilities in it. And those devices are just starting to ship now. Um, so we will probably end up with another couple billion devices that would be capable of running a tamper-resistant Trezor-grade wallet inside your smartphone over the course of the next 18, 24 months. So I thought I'd just draw a couple simple pictures. Um, so this is a really simple model of what it would mean to have my machine as a token. A machine as a token is a very simple but very easy thing. It just says, if I'm going to spend this amount of money, then only let me spend it from a machine I've pre-registered with the site. Anyone could add this to any existing online wallet today. It's truly trivial and it's an existing service that's operational on the web today. And all it's doing is once I register my device, the next time I go back, all I'm doing is proving it was the previous device I registered. And so what you're able to do is bind your machine to your account. Now you, then you can make a rule if the, if the online wallet said, Look, to spend $100, you can only do it from your device. Maybe that's the wrong threshold rule. Maybe you want to say it's $1,000. You can blow $999 with your, your Android phone anywhere in the world in Bitcoin. But if you want to spend $1,000, you have to spend it from a known device. And, and that way, it changes the relationship with how much you have to steal it before you can steal a transaction. The second piece is a little bit more complicated. So one of the challenges we'd like to have would be, how do I build an online wallet where I don't have to trust the operator with my private key? And so I've very specifically drawn black boxes on this screen, because you should think of them that way. What we'd like to have running in our online wallet service is a black box. By the way, you can commercially buy these. There are quite a few manufacturers who make them. And what it should do is import an encrypted private key that's encrypted with keying material on my trusted device. And so only when my trusted device is in presence of that um, wallet will I be able to actually operate on my private key. So you could go steal all the private keys from that service provider. They will serve you no purpose at all unless you also have control of my device. Um, this is, again, a relatively simple transaction. About a billion corp corporate class laptops, desktops, and workstations would support this out of the box. 
pretty simple piece of HSM technology to put in the head end, um, made by a variety of different manufacturers, so pick the organization you'd like to trust. There are Israeli ones, American ones, Taiwanese ones. You know, I'm sure you can get one where you can put one inside the other and then you can trust more than one person. Um, but a very simple mechanism to protect a key where I don't actually really have to believe that the infrastructure run by my service provider, if it's compromised, causes the compromise of my account. And by far, I think what the real goal of my organization is, is to help you build the black box for the execution of the transaction within the client. So this is a technology that would be building an app that supports the protection of the private key. Today on Intel's trusted execution technology, it supports secure input. So no piece of malware will be able to steal the pin number that's used to permission the use of the private key on the local machine. They have an existing trusted input mechanism on Intel TXT that allows them to write directly to the display um, graphics memory. And so they're able to present a, a screen on your screen that the operating system can't see. If you push print screen, it comes up with a black box on the screen. It's very cool. What you're able to do is put a pin pad up where you just scramble the numbers so they're not always in the same order. And you just take your mouse and click in your five digit pin. Dee -dee 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 -dee. And even though I tracked your mouse clicks, doesn't matter because I don't know what buttons you were pushing. So that permissions the key. That allows me then to perform the actual ceremony of creating an instruction for the blockchain in basically a separate computing device that is running signed, encryptically protected code, running tamper resistant, isolated from the operating system, cannot be seen by malware, is completely isolated from the rest of the hardware on the system, and it has a really simple consumer GUI interface that the consumer would come to expect, which is a little pin pad. You click the numbers, it'll be a little annoying to figure out where the seven number is, because it'll keep moving around. And, and away you go. And, and so that becomes a really elegant method. Now, one of the other things you'd want to do is, of course, I've got to back up my keys. And so whether you use something like BitArmor or somebody else to print a cold wallet is great, but do it in a manner where on my trusted display, instead of reading out the 34 characters through the trusted display, insecurely print it but it printed encrypted with a simple um, password that is generated through my trusted display of four or five characters I write on that same sheet of paper. And then as long as I have that sheet of paper and I can consummate another one of those environments, I can recover. And, and yet, unless there's somebody with a video camera, there is no one currently at this conference who could write software who could alter the state of that private key or client-side wallet if we gave them all week and an infinite amount of resource. And that's the cool part. This is properly executed, modern, state-of-the-art isolation in the machines. So the goal here is to replace user training with automation. This isn't about, don't do this, don't do that, make sure you only open it on this machine, buy a separate printer, put it in a closet, buy another PC, put it in a closet, only do your transactions there, then take a code, put it over here, take a picture, show it to that, then send it to here, and by the way, don't show your wife the picture because she might take the code and spend it over there and you won't even know. This isn't gonna work well. We, th this level of training just doesn't function for us. So how do we provide really strong protection, really strong pin entry? This is a clear path to going down that direction. Are the technologies perfect today? No. The AMD technology that they're bringing on a system on a chip that ships in approximately a couple months on every new AMD processor doesn't have the same quality of secure input that the Intel technology has. So which one are you gonna buy? You know, the beauty of this is you get to choose. By the way, if you're buying video games and what you wanna do is play really high-end graphic video games, buying an Intel processor is really cool today. I mean, AMD processor versus an Intel processor. This has been going on for a long time. If all of a sudden AMD is losing market share because they don't have secure pin entry, guess what? They'll add secure pin entry. And there are lots of different ways to accomplish that. So this is a way to bring pressure through the manufacturing chain. The other side of this equation is that there are a billion devices that have a thing to hold keys. The question is, how are we going to provision them? So there's a whole other side of this equation, which is, 
what would it look like to do global device identity and supply chain management as an example using the blockchain as opposed to a certificate authority as the core mechanism to store the fact that this was a machine built by this vendor on this day with these parts. So there's some incredible applications. If you want to explore this a little bit, there's a great white paper that was written by Johns Hopkins on the replacement of what's called the privacy CA with the blockchain, which was published in October of last year. They're the leading research guys on building the high assurance platforms for the NSA. I think it's really interesting that they're looking at these pieces. So this is how we help to secure it. Let's use the tools that are built in. Let's enable the power of these capabilities. Let's leverage the built-in security to protect the private key and simplify the transaction. And ultimately, modern commerce needs to become modern. Right now, we're not doing any better than a mag stripe card, guys. I would argue the mad stripe card is actually kind of nicer right now for a consumer experience than we're doing with the 34 character private key thing with a QR code and don't flash this one, but flash, oh my goodness. You know, nobody lost, well, not nobody. I'm sure they lost their credit cards by holding them up on TV also, but um, it's just crazy. So my last slide. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity. Industry has invested $5 billion to secure the Bitcoin private key. You have no obligation to use it. But if you want to, it's really cool what you can do. And then when we begin to explore concepts like what MasterCoin is talking about, what Ethereum is talking about, with more complex transactions and more complex infrastructure, they're talking about writing a programmatic language for contracts in the web, but those contracts are only actually implemented by the nodes that are up in the sky because they're the only thing you can trust. You haven't yet really thought about what the concept of endpoint participation in trustworthy computing could be. Um, it's not quite an apps model, but you can think of it along those kinds of lines. It's in the same way as listening to Ethereum say, you know, what their project is looks like flash on the internet. This is an opportunity to re-engage a billion clients in participation of the formation and reaction in the transactions. And I think we don't even understand yet what the opportunities are that are associated with that. But these tools are really important to improving the quality and capability of the services that are out there. So with that, I'll stop. I think if there are any questions. Questions for Stephen? Hi, I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering, they put in a billion of these chips. What was their purpose? They weren't thinking about Bitcoin. When oh, it's really simple. So um, a couple of reasons. One is there's a huge and fundamental security hole in all compute power today, which is if I alter the BIOS on your computer underneath the boot of your operating system, I own your machine, and you're done. With the advent of UEFI, the Universal Enhanced Firmware Interface, which has now standardized, in essence, the operating system that runs before your operating system on every machine, doesn't matter whether it's running Linux, Mac OS, Android, whatever, it's all, all running UEFI. Cool. So last year, Saudi Aramco lost 40,000 machines that had to be physically replaced. They traded oil futures on their trading desk for over 90 days with a fax machine because they had no compute power. Just understand that this is true for the entire city of Austin's infrastructure. And so the question is, what's your protection model? The purpose of trusted computing on a protection basis is it's the thing that stores the chain of trust that's built from the root of booting your computer. Every step is measured and signed, and that chain that's built in the boot process is stored in the trusted platform module so later on you can ask it about the truth. So anywhere later on in the life of your PC, you can ask the miniature blockchain inside the TPM whether or not the boot process was correctly executed. And therefore, you can make a decision that says, oh, I'm not going to let you on the network. You didn't boot correctly. You're under remediation. You get to go to this little site over here, and until you pass a health check, 
we're not going to let you on the network. So that was one of the core reasons. The second reason is um, probably more economically interesting long term for everybody, which is, so are we moving from box software to subscription? Like is Microsoft going from Office 365, they sell you a box for 300 bucks, or, and we're now going to the online version. Cool. How's that going for Netflix? Like nobody's sharing passwords, none of my kids know anybody else's passwords, there's no fraud in Netflix, everybody's paying their proper amount and they're all playing the right deal. Oh God, no, everybody's stealing everybody's account. Well, so how do you have a global software industry built on subscription without a set-top box? So this is the mechanism so that anybody, and I emphasize the word anybody, can run their own iTunes. You want to deliver software, you want to charge on a subscription basis, you can bind the licensing of that software on a subscription basis to the platforms that pay. Um, it not, should not be a surprise to anybody that it was a very tough negotiation to get trusted computing accepted for broad global distribution into China because clearly this is how we make the Chinese pay for every copy of Windows. By the way, that's okay. We're good with that. Like the one copy thing and they don't pay and we all have to pay for a copy of whatever OS you buy. There's no constraints. You can run Linux, you can run Windows, you can run whatever you want. If you choose to run Windows and bootstrap it up into Windows, then the system will hiccup if all of a sudden somebody comes along and runs a bare metal hypervisor in between your BIOS and your Windows. Which, by the way, would steal 100% of every current Bitcoin transaction done on an endpoint if I install my bare metal hypervisor that is a man in the middle between your operating system and the hardware. So don't worry about anything anybody tells you. You can steal everything if you own the bare metal hypervisor. Right now, there are no protections on anyone installing a bare metal hypervisor on your machine, and Windows can't detect it. Neither can Windows antivirus. This is true on Linux, Apple. It's, you can pick your operating system of choice. Yes? So, as I understand it, uh, you have a hardware device that generates a private key um, to sign transaction to sign Bitcoin transactions. Is that is that correct? So, so no, a TPM doesn't run the elliptic curve protocol of Bitcoin. So, what you would do is you would use the TPM to seal or encrypt uh -huh. the private key that is then okay. used. Okay. And 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 in a trusted execution model you would actually have a container, a programmatic container, where you write an app that would do the actual generation of the public private key or could have an interface where you type your private key in, it doesn't really matter. So it can be generated internally or delivered from the outside. And then it would not only protect that private key, but it would also do the, the formation and signing of the instruction to the blockchain or the, I like to say it as a transaction, but it's really not. The transaction doesn't occur until the blockchain accepts it. It really is the formation of the instruction. This is all about improving the quality of instructions to the blockchain. Okay, so um, you're still able to uh, make copies of the private key then? Is that, is that correct? Certainly, if you ch absolutely. You'd, what you'd like is all of your devices to talk to each other. So if you add private key to device A and you choose to have it work this way, it would magically copy your private key from device A to device B, C, and D because they're all your devices. So you'd have to go through a ceremony that marries device A and device B and device C to be mine. There are, no one would know that key except for me. And so they could securely talk to each other. And having your robot wallets communicate with each other to facilitate your life so that when you add a Bitcoin wallet on A, it magically appears on B and C, that'd be fantastic. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Now, one thing you're saying is Intel. Sure. I know, I mean, Intel's a great chip. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. However, I do know that a lot of the chips that which some, a lot of miners and fellow people use is the AMD chip. The AMD chip, the ATI slash AMD uh, right, video. The graphics processor. Right. Now, I mean, okay, what's... 
So are you saying that we all have to go to Intel just to get this? No. So AMD is shipping their system on a chip with an embedded ARM crypto processor that would run a wallet capability. There is a difference today between an Intel platform and an AMD platform. The Intel platform has a better trusted, ex um, trusted input mechanism, which just has not been duplicated by AMD. Now, how could AMD, for example, add trusted input without spinning the chip? You could get a keyboard manufacturer, as an example, to have a simple change to the firmware of the keyboard that would allow it to go into a secure mode so that you had encrypted from the keyboard controller through to the trust execution environment and AMD would work perfectly. We actually built reference designs of that almost a dozen years ago. The, the reality is those kinds of capabilities are simple. The question is, would you or would you not want to have that in your laptop? If you come and everybody starts buying Intel laptops and you can go to the O2 guys who build the chips for keyboards and say, hey, add these 100 lines of code to your keyboard firmware and we'll get secure input to the trusted execution environment for the entire Bitcoin space. And now the entire ecosystem of AMD that uses that keyboard controller chip on their laptops works. There's an incentive to do it. This is market driven at the end of the day. If people believe that you would like to have a completely secure wallet environment, then let's get the hardware guys to build us a completely secure wallet environment because there's no question the embedded free solution that comes in your box is gonna be cheaper than any external device you can buy. Did I answer your question? A little bit. Well, I'm here afterwards. I'm happy to provide greater clarity on it. But fundamentally, there is an AMD and an Intel solution and an ARM solution, which gets you all the smartphone guys. Yeah, so a, a lot of us don't really trust Microsoft. And uh, for example, on my computer, I load Linux and I just turn off the TPM. Um, what's the status? I haven't been paying attention of uh, like Linux distributions using TPM. Because as far as I know, none of the major ones are doing that right now. So if you wanted to buy the best Bitcoin wallet machine you could today, go buy a General Dynamics high assurance platform. They cost $25,000. And they have um, SE Linux, fully protected by a trusted platform module. And it's how the US government does high assurance, classified, unclassified, same machine. OK? So they have added. No, no, I'm just, I'm just, using, it, I'm just, I'm just using it as an example. The Linux capabilities in SE Linux have the full support for a trusted platform module in open source, in the execution capabilities. I'm just saying that within the commercial distribution of SE Linux today, there are all the tools necessary to build, if you want to take the time and energy to do it, what in essence General Dynamics is now delivering for way too much money to the US government for a classified, unclassified, single unit box. What you want for a Bitcoin wallet is a classified side, completely isolated properly from your unclassified side, which you're web browsing and doing word processing, whatever. When you want to do a transaction, you push a button and it executes in, an, in its own environment a, um, a high assurance protected mechanism. There are a bunch of ways to do it. They're probably not as inexpensive as using the embedded hardware, and they're probably not quite as good because there are more lines of code. There are companies like Linux Works that do isolation kernels running on Linux and Windows, so you can have a dual boot environment. They also do, do um, Android. So that you end up with a bare metal hypervisor assured by the trusted computing platforms that, that provides the isolation between the two sides. So it's as though I had my own extra compute device to do my wallet. So, so SE Linux right now supports TPM Absolutely. out of the box? OK, I hadn't been paying attention. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Deary. Um, I have a question about the, um, the TPM version 2. Mm -hmm. um, can I load arbitrary crypto code onto that? Uh, for example, to um, implement the, like an ED DSA to get around the, um, the Android wallets had a bug last year right. where they were leaking private key information. Um, and then there's new crypto that's uh, advanced on top of that, which is auditable so okay. that you um, can tell if it's leaking so information. So TPM 2.0 is crypto agile, which means that it will support more than one algorithm. It is, however, not in the field upgradable by the end user. So 
It's a little bit of a complicated answer to your question. The answer is that the manufacturer of that device potentially can upgrade it. Others may not have implemented the infrastructure necessary to do that. So it's a little bit, TPM 2.0 is new enough that it's a little bit dependent on the implementation. I think you give it another, you know, another year, another 18 months, it will become much more predictable what you can and can't do with the crypto, crypto agile capabilities of TPM 2.0. That was the whole purpose. Actually, the real reason was because the Chinese guys don't trust the Americans, the Americans don't trust the Chinese, the Germans don't trust anybody, they all wanted their own algorithms, right? So the algorithms might actually do the same thing. They might, all three of them, be SHA-256 or, or an elliptic curve algorithm. It might be exactly the same algorithm, but for obvious reasons, implemented by their engineers. So you can decide, which government you want to trust to put the most effective and most tamper-resistant backdoors into whichever thing they do. In reality, with any crypto, the math is sufficiently complex these days that the people who implement it, you have to trust. Whether it's open source or not, it's extremely hard, even in open source, to pace through the mathematics of these computations and determine that this is an algorithm that doesn't have an intrinsic weakness. We're trusting the math and a bunch of people who tell us that the math is good. Um, and so it's, it's, it's just, it is kind of is what it is. The best way to address this is very large scale, large scale commodity volume, because then everybody in this room can go get one, and you can try and take it apart. And if you find a weakness, you can publish it. And the beauty of Black Hat is they publish it. And sometimes they probably shouldn't. Like last year, they published a BIOS vulnerability for which there's no patch. It's going to be there for a while, um, which is they demonstrated the compromising of the core root of trust in the BIOS through a reflashing of the, surviving through the reflashing of a BIOS, which means you have to throw your machines away. You get a BIOS attack, throw the machine away. There is no recovery. That's a pretty, that's a pretty expensive bug if you discover that your machines have been compromised at a BIOS root level, you must throw your machine away. Any other questions? So I'll make one last thing, because I was going to say it in my presentation, and I didn't say it. One of the questions I almost always get asked is, well, what happens if I lose my machine? Because now I've bound all these keys to my machine. What do I do? And so I wanted to show you something. Um, so this is probably one of the most computer computers in this facility running Windows 8. And the reason why is because it has, in this case, a two-year-old Samsung solid-state encrypted hard drive. And if you don't know the password to this hard drive, my machine's data doesn't exist. The technology, this is a trusted computing group standard as well. It's called Opal. But this is the mechanism to bind humans to machines. It's the industry standard to bind humans to machines. It supports dozens of users, tamper-resistant recovery, one-time use recovery, multiple partitions. Um, we've done amazingly cool research projects with these drives. Um, dual boot drives with an OR statement. The two machines will never exist in the same time-space continuum. It's kind of an interesting concept. Um, and so you can build things like, you know, if you wanted to today, you get one of these drives, build an OR statement, have a second machine in your other device, cold boot your machine to your wallet, and that wallet will never exist at the same time your regular machine exists, which has really interesting properties. Um, and so. It's the combination of these technologies that puts things together in layers. This is a completely independent supply chain that would need to be compromised to steal my wallet by just adding this. These are just about free. You can go out there, you can go to Staples, you can buy drives that have Opal capability in them. They don't cost any more than drives that don't have Opal capability. And they're, the software out there to deploy them is a variety, available from a variety of different manufacturers. So with that, thank you very much, guys. Oh, I can, oh, you can always lose things. No, 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 a cold store wallet to keep, you know, where do you keep your private key? First, I would rely on multiple devices. Then I would rely on a paper backup somewhere. Paper backup is great. You know, who do you give your paper backup to? Right, it's an interesting challenge. Or can I divide the paper backup and give half to three different people? Or if I had lots of different friends with trusted computing, maybe I can trust my friends. I mean, you could do all sorts of crazy things for the, for the complete disaster recovery scenario trust your auditor, you know, I mean, there are lots of different ways to accomplish that, that 
put a code out there that isn't actually useful for doing transactions. And I think this is where the hierarchical wallets are really important because I could have keys that have no value, but are keys that are used to recover all the wallets that do have value. And, and so, by the way, we don't need to explain this to consumers. We really, really don't. We just need to set it up right. Don't give them the choices. There are no options. There's no advance button. It just gets set up right. From the people in this room and in the other rooms that are here that would tell you this is the right way to set up a wallet, we're just bringing a set of tools to come play. We're not a wallet company. We want to build the black box that supports anybody who builds a wallet, anybody who builds an exchange. Here are the tools that they can use. Thanks.